started to talk about the rules of the 2019 solar car challenge. Um, the very, very first thing you want to notice is that the rules have a provision for event updates. And those event updates have the same authority as the written rules itself. And so uh, if you filled in an intent to race already, uh, you will be getting these updates. These updates are also posted on our website. Every event update has the same authority and you have to follow them in the same way as the body of the rules. Uh, please, please, wherever you are working on your car, have many, many copies of the rules lying around, right? A lot of times, teams will go and read the rules and say, yeah, I understand the rules, especially teams that have been around for a while. They say, yeah, I understand the rules, I read it. And then they go start building, and then you sort of forget certain clauses. And so, um, you know, uh, you really want <clears throat> to have the rules there so that you can reference them. You can, you can, you can always go back and say, wait, What's the turning radius again? Wait, what's the size of the fuse? Um, where do I need to have uh, locking nuts or, or, uh, or um, uh, lock tight and things like that? You want to be able to refer back to it. Follow the engineering life cycle. You know, as a professional engineer, we, we love this uh, type of uh, way where you look at the requirements, which are the rules, you design something according to the rules, you build it as part of implementation, then you go back and verify that you've met every rule. So as you go through and as you design your car, do a design, verify it still meets the rules. Build your car, as you build the car, verify that you met the rules because if you don't meet the rules, you bring your car to the race, we're then going to tell you here, you didn't comply with this rule, you got to fix it. You didn't comply with this rule, you got to fix it. And then it ends up that you have to add stress to your life trying to get everything done in time. You should be able to test for all the rules before you get here. Don't read the rules all at once and in one sitting. You want to be repeating. You read the rules a few times over the course of time. And we have a lot of pictures out there on our web page that shows all the different solar cars. We even show pictures in, in these training presentations. That doesn't mean that those pictures comply with the rules. They could be grandfathered in. They could be no longer operating as solar cars. The, the body of the rules is really the ultimate authority, not car examples, okay? Okay, important dates. Uh, we want to remind you that if you have not already done so and that you intend to race this summer, you should go online to the Solar Car Challenge website, go to the forms page and fill out an intent to race form. Very simple form, doesn't promise anything, doesn't mean that you're guaranteed to enter, it just says, I intend to race. And from that, you get email updates to uh, what's going on, uh, event updates if we issue any, just information starts flowing your way. So please do so if you have not already done so. But the key, key deadline is March 1st. If you intend to race in the 2019 Solar Car Challenge, you must have your registration postmarked by March 1st. We do require you to do two things as part of your registration. You must send in a soft copy to Dr. Marks via email, and you must send a physical copy to the address in the registration. So we need you to do both of these things. Okay, so a lot of teams, they may just do one or the other. We need both. As part of registration, including the registration document that's on the web page that you can get from the forms page, we need certain other information, including your mechanical diagram that has the crush zones clearly labeled, 
your electrical diagram that shows how your electrical system is wired together, a digital team photo that could just be emailed, and manufacturers data sheets for all sorts of things that, so that we can check whether or not you comply with uh, the regulations of your class. So as we said, digital and hard copies are required. Question. The hard copy must be postmarked by March 1st. It can be delivered or arrived at the location after March 1st. It just needs to be sent by March 1st. Yes? Uh, what if uh, someone on the solar or judging team were to accidentally damage the hard copy in some way? It doesn't matter. You've submitted your hard copy. That's sufficient. Uh, to, to you, the responsibility is to send a hard copy. After that, if, if the, the copy gets damaged uh, you know, by us, it doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's talk a little bit about divisions. Uh, we talked about that earlier today, but uh, classic division, advanced classic, uh, advanced division, and electric solar. Primarily, the, the change here is, uh, and I forgot, I thought I made this modification, but the advanced classic is three or more years uh, that you've participated in the solar car challenge. It, this clause about basic vehicle structure and major components have been stricken or will be stricken. Okay. Now, from there, let's get into the body of the rules. The body of the rules, section five, is the key portion as you build your car. Not to say that other portions are unimportant, but as you build your car, you want to be focusing on section five. Uh, I'm going to just sort of walk you through some of these things. Uh, of course, you have dimensional requirements that apply to your classic and advanced division cars. Uh, electric solar will have other regulations. Um, you, you've got to have a windshield, you've got to have a belly pan, uh, those are requirements we call out. In, in this section in 5.2, that's the critical uh, regulations with regard to roll cage, roll bar, and crush zone. So please read that carefully. There are certain regulations with regard to the size of the roll bar. The size uh, of the roll bar uh, is right here in terms of a five centimeter outside diameter with uh, certain material thicknesses that are required. There is a uh, roll cage, uh, out of dimension things. There's a there's few critical measurements here. The intent here is to provide some guideline as to how you might build it. These are really meant for you to think about how do I keep my driver safe? If you're able to do some engineering to show us and calculate for us appropriate driver protection that's equivalent to the standard that we provide here, there is a waiver process that you may submit that you would send to us not only the request, but the engineering justification for why you feel it's equivalent in strength. And then we can then evaluate it. Those waiver requests must be received by May 1st. After that, we will not issue any waiver requests. So please be careful about the timeline there. In section 5.4, we talk about batteries. And so we talk about the, the capacity of the battery, the size of the fuse, the requirements for where you put the batteries and, and the fans for it. OK, let's talk about crush zones for a second. Um, this is a diagram taken straight from the rules. And it's always a controversial diagram because it's somewhat new in the way this is done. Um, the crush zone, we say, must encompass the entire driver's head, shoulders, you know, hips, basically the entire body, which is right there. And so you, you want to have some structures that go and, and, and cover the entire 
part of the body horizontally, right? And we're talking about side impact, front impact, rear impact. You're not going to get a meteor striking from the top, you know, uh, on, on the driver. That's not part of uh, the risk here. <laughs> and so you want to have some representative structures horizontally uh, from uh, this body position to, to protect the driver. And that's what this, the crush zone rule is really intended for. Okay, we spent a lot of time talking about electrical uh, today, and so I will just highlight a certain number of things. Um, the, the main fuse uh, needs to be rated for a, less than 125% of the expected peak current. The whole idea is your peak current is really the maximum current draw you would expect to ever get, you know, ever use, right? And that's usually rated by the peak current draw uh, of, the, uh, of the motor. So you really can't drive it more than that. 125% of that allows you some leeway so that the fuse doesn't trip when you get to peak. And it's got to be currently uh, rate, rated as uh, fast blow or very fast blow. DC rated for the, for the appropriate current. And so uh, a lot of teams t tend to use this Copper Busman type of ANN. Uh, ANN means very fast blow, very fast acting. That's, that's their designation for it. Okay. Uh, we say that the batteries must be in a rigid uh, enclosure, must have forced air ventilation. That ventilation must exhaust behind the driver's compartment. So if you have batteries in front of your uh, driver, you're going to then need to route that ventilation all the way back behind the driver so that as the car is moving, you're not exhausting uh, battery fumes into the driver compartment. Okay? We talked about supplemental batteries and disconnect switches earlier today. This is a diagram that shows you the position of uh, disconnect switches. One of the key points to make is, and we've seen this in, in past registration entries, your array disconnects must be first in series after the power tracker. So this positive end of the power tracker needs to connect to the array, uh, uh, the array disconnects before it gets connected to the batteries. Okay, we have seen sometimes that teams put this disconnect on the negative side the rules require you first in series from the positive side. And it, there's a wording in there that says, if present. And that's really there to cover. If you don't have power trackers, if you happen to match your array perfectly to the uh, voltage of your uh, battery pack, we don't recommend this because you lose a lot of power this way. But if you just can't afford power trackers, you could do that. Uh, then we need that positive uh, end of that, of that bank of uh, solar panels to be then connected to the array disconnect. So that's the rule on the location of the array disconnect. <clears throat> we talked about no grounding the frame and the, really the real reason is to make sure that if, in case you uh, drill something or some, some short happens, it doesn't create a quick uh, electrical circuit. Uh, we, we, uh, we say that you have to have wires and insulation connections that are properly sized, and so it's sized to the continuous system current. Right? So your fuses are, are rated to the peak current, your wires are rated to the continuous current. Okay? Next we want to talk about visibility. Um, this is an issue primarily with uh, cars that are wing over body or cars in which um, your, the driver's head just sort of peeks up just over the array. Your forward visibility, uh, you have to, you have a, the driver have to be sitting 70 centimeters from the ground. It needs, they need to be able to see a point eight meters in front of the vehicle on the ground. And so if you have certain vehicle things in the way, that would be a concern. 
And you need to be able to see up 10 degrees above the horizon. I think this presentation is not the updated one. I will say that the way we do this in scrutineering is we will take a pole and we will put it some distance away from the driver. And using the magic of trigonometry, we are able to discern the 10 degree horizon by taking the distance from the eyes to, the, to where the pole is located. And we take the, the height of the pole minus the height of the eye and calculate the angle of what you can see. We would put a card on top of that pole to see that you can see a particular color. And we will see that if you can't identify that, you can't see 10 degrees above the horizon. That is really there so that when you're on the road, you can look up and see street lights when you're stopped. So uh, we'll be testing for that during scrutineering, as with every other rule. OK, other visibility uh, rules in terms of side visibility and rear visibility. Uh, one note is rear visibility, you can do that with a camera, so long as you can still see the pattern of the 45 degrees off the center line on both sides and the, and the 15 meters behind the car. Uh, we talked a bit about braking and the static dynamic test that we do. We talked about the turning radius. Um, the warning systems, there is a, uh, a thing in there that says, hey, you have to be able to see you know, 100 meters behind you uh, with, the, with the brake lights, uh, 30 meters for turn signals, and there's a decibel, uh, there's a decibel rating for the horn. So uh, things to look at and reference. Uh, there's a particular uh, set of driver safety regulations that I encourage you to read. I will highlight one specific part, and it's protective eyewear in the garage area. If you are working on your car in the garage area, I don't care if you're turning a screwdriver you know, uh, or, or, or a wrench or anything like that, you must be wearing protective eyewear in the garage area when you're working on your car. So just plan to get something that's comfortable and just leave it on whenever you're in the garage area. Okay? And that's really there. I, I know, you know the typical use for the eyewear would be for power tools, but I've seen where you know, uh, someone, you know, some, some part gets unscrewed and it sort of flips and, and, and gets in the air. You want to protect yourself. And so that's why we have that rule in place. Uh, the rest of the rules with regard to throttle that has to return to zero. There's a, other sets of rules that we would encourage you to read. Um, section six goes over the nature of the event. I'm not going to cover the details other than the fact that on a track race this year, you get credit for the number of complete laps, and that's how we calculate the winner. In section eight, uh, we want to make note that the registration fees have increased this year, so uh, just be aware of that. Um, there is a, also for road races uh, a, a question about license plates and, and how in exchange for liability insurance, we'll give you a license plate for road races. Uh, regardless if it's a road race or a track race, we do need liability insurance by June 1st. A lot of times, if you're part of a school, your school will cover liability insurance for your car just because it's just another car. If you are uh, an after-school activity, a club, or things like that, you may have difficulty finding uh, yourself covered by school liability insurance. If this is the case, uh, we have arranged uh, with an insurance company, a local insurance company here, that will provide uh, that liability insurance for you for a fee. Uh, we do not get any money out of that. We're just doing it as a service to you. So uh, if you need liability insurance, you can certainly come up and talk to me afterwards and I can provide you that information. It will also be issued as event updates as you get closer to the race. Finally, I want to highlight the fact that team guests 
must comply with the race rules. We have certain rules required uh, dress code, essentially. You must have a full brim hat. You must have closed toed shoes. You must have safety glasses when working in the garage. That applies to all the team members, including the team sponsors, advisors, chaperones, but it also applies to any guests that you bring to come and, and watch us during the race. And so if they're associated with you, please let them know of these rules. Uh, some teams have a box of full brimmed hats ready for guests so that when they come, they can hand them a hat and say, here you go, wear this while you're here. So that's a way to comply with the rules. Uh, the rest of the rules are, are really more of uh, additional details. Um, there are certain rules with regard to support vehicles that you'll want to make a, uh, keep an eye on in terms of on the track, how do you get a support vehicle on the track? It needs to have certain safety equipment. We will be testing for that as part of scrutineering, so definitely keep an eye on that. Okay, um, as you know, the electric solar division is a fairly new division. It's got its own section in the rules, so we'll go through uh, some of that. Of course, you know the concept is that you have a somewhat semi-permanent uh, charging station where you would uh, have your solar panels and you would then swap your batteries in and out of that. And so it represents how the future may look like if you have electric cars you can swap or you can do fast charge like Tesla does and things like that. We will say uh, that the dimensions of the electric solar power car is different than that of the classic or advanced divisions you're primarily looking at minimum dimensions, not maximum dimensions. So, and, and so you want to keep an eye on that. Um, we will say that we are concerned about cars that are uh, building somewhat um, non-useful structures to meet with the minimum regulation. And so we will be keeping an eye on that and you will see future rules address this um, in terms of making sure that fins, spikes, antenna, you know, things like that are not considered part of meeting the minimum dimensions. We're concerned that people uh, add components to the thing to meet the minimum requirements, but then, uh, add danger to, uh, to teams that are falling behind you, okay? So uh, we, we also say that your passengers, you must, have, you must have a driver and a passenger, you must have them seated in an upright uh, position, so no laying down like you would in a normal solar car. Um, so uh, you need to do that as well. Uh, we have ballasting uh, requirements for this class. Um, we have uh, two battery boxes with interchangeable, you know, between the charging station and the car. Um, and here's the key part. At the Texmo Speedway, when you arrive there, you will be invited to set up your charging station in a specific area. Once it is there, it will remain there for the duration of the race. So make sure you set it up in a way that, you know, you can rotate it, but you can't move it. That it's supposed to represent a charging station, right? A physical location where things are located. Yes? So this location, when we did our spot on the lane, was it used over by where everybody's sitting, or was it used over by the garages? It would be over by the garages. It's not by your pit spot. There would be specific location uh, where all the charging stations will be located. Um, uh, so our charging station is out into our trailer, so it doesn't still comply with the rules if the passenger just goes pick up their car on the track. Yeah, that would be fine. It just needs to be parked right back where, yeah. okay. where it was afterwards. Yep. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. So uh, that, that's the thing is, you know, we're, we're going to have designated spots for where your charging stations are going to be. That's where they reside. You can rotate them as you need to, um, but it's, that's the location, okay? Um, one of the new things that we've done recently 
is uh, what, what happens is that you randomly draw for the particular slots where the charging stations are. But because the charging stations aren't equidistant to the track, uh, we will ask that all the cars uh, follow the predefined track so every uh, team, as it comes off the track, does the battery exchange and, and gets back on the track, follow a defined track so that there's no advantage to being closer to the track or further from the track. Every team needs to go through the same uh, same distance. And of course the fun part is that uh, as part of this to demonstrate the practicality, uh, you will be asked to do a particular task each day to represent something like, you know, I need to go to a grocery store to get something. Could I drive a car like this uh, to do that task? We would ask you to demonstrate something to that effect. So that's all I have for the rules. And so now I will invite our interim technical director, Taylor Davis, to walk you through how you can comply with these rules and how we uh, can be successful in your scrutineering process.